Oliver. Hello. Okay, we are here. Sorry, I don't know quite what happened there. Uh, so, how are you, Brendan? Up in the uh, up in the lost north. Yeah, the lost north. I was nearly down your neck of the. Well, I was down the south uh, west of the city in uh, a barrio called Los Pinos, uh, which is kind of relevant because uh, later today we're going to be talking about uh, different barrios and starting off with uh, the historic centre. Uh, so I was in a, a part of town that I don't think uh, I've ever been to before, near uh, a place called Porto 72, uh, Los Pinos, and get the Por Put a jazz, as they would say, but um, a nice cycle ride, I have to say. And thankfully, I missed all the heavy downpours of rain, so that was that. That was a good, a good one. Uh, I I most certainly did not miss those downpours of rain, and I did think to myself, Brendan, and maybe this is something we should talk about next week, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I did think to myself, this is ridiculous. As I walked back through Chapinero, using sunglasses and a raincoat at the same time because it was both incredibly sunny and pouring with rain uh, at one and the same time which uh, you know that's something i never really came across before i came to uh, to bogota well, what's that song sunshine on a rainy day makes my heart uh, what is it makes my heart go or something like that forget what no what is it you know the song sunshine on a rainy day oh makes my soul makes my soul Trip, trip away. If anybody can find out who the singer of that song is, the first one to write in will uh, win a free uh, artisanal beer courtesy of Ollie Pritchard. Uh, will we get cracking on with it? We've a lot to talk about, as ever. So let's get on with it. And Ollie, for tonight's Boggins and Nights, Colombia's only live and interactive English language chat show, as you all know by now, we're calling it Bite Size Bogota. We've spoken before about how in many ways Colombia's capital is a patchwork of independent barrios and localities within which almost all the everyday needs of residents are met. In a nod to that, over the coming weeks, we'll be taking a look at some of those neighborhoods. Today, appropriately enough, as I mentioned, we're starting off with La Candelaria, a place that is many visitors' first impression of Bogota and where the city itself first emerged, of course. From a character and cultural perspective, it has much going for it, not to mention the fact that it's the higher level, or third level, if you will, I'm not sure if it's higher, uh, education <laughs> hub, as uh, Ollie well knows. Uh, we want to know uh, what La Candelaria and its immediate surrounds mean to you. Perhaps you live there, or you once did, and have fond memories of the place, or is it a case, after having lived there, that you're now rather indifferent to that part of town? Do you adore it or do you abhor it? Get your thoughts into us right now by using the live comment facility and they will appear here on our screen and we will have a, a copy of them so you can send them now and we'll get to that topic just after uh, the half hour. And of course, if you're watching this recorded, you can still get involved by commenting on where you're viewing or via tweet, the handle being at Bogota Post with the hashtag Bogota Nights. Of course, Bogota Post, everybody's favorite English language newspaper here in the capital city. It is viewer interaction, guys, that keeps this show on the road after all, so do send us your thoughts. Uh, before we take a virtual trip around La Candelaria, it's our review of the week's big news stories. The tax reform proposals, which we briefly discussed in last week's show, uh, when they've just been announced, have been causing plenty of heated debate since. Unsurprisingly, Ollie has much to say on the topic, as well as a bug as opposed to article. Uh, but first, the COVID situation continues to evolve, and with it, so do the containment measures. What's the story for the coming days, Ollie? Or is it a case of uh, stick to your media because anything could happen? Yeah, that's definitely that's excellent advice, uh, Brendan. Definitely stick to your media. I mean, again, we, we've talked a bit about this being problematic, you know, um, uh, last week where we had things suddenly jumped on us. Um, it, it is quite problematic because, um, you know, not everybody has data all the time. Not everyone can walk around glued to Twitter where a lot of these announcements, um, you know, come out. Yeah, I mean, look, it, Claudia Lopez was off today saying that we're at 89.6% uh, UCI um, occupation. And, and that basically means we're going to go over 90 very soon. Uh, and that's going to trigger in, you know, new consultants. It's all a bit bizarre. They said last 
Tuesday we were going to have a revision of the rules, but then it was brought forward to Monday because uh, we crossed the 85%, uh, you know, the 85% um, uh, threshold, which which meant that's why we've had the uh, curfew from eight. Uh, we've crossed. We're going to cross 90 very soon. That will be other things. They're saying now that on Sunday we'll hear, you know, there'll be a kind of revision and, and uh, an update. I'm guessing there's going to be a two-week full lockdown. That's that's my guess. Who knows? Yeah, you can't move anything in a, in a row at this stage. Uh, and, and again, what, as we what talk... I, what I, well, hang on. One thing I can tell you, just just sorry, quickly, Brendan, to get on. Um, uh, friends of mine who work in schools, uh, at least two of them, have been told you might not be coming in on Monday. So it appears there's some kind of, um, you know, preparations being made. Okay. Is that, uh, are they public or private schools? Uh, private. Okay. Okay. Uh, because I, I was going to say, though, um, obviously, you know, the measures are pretty clear now in terms of if you pass certain thresholds in terms of uh, UCI, ICU, whichever you want to call it, capacity, then these are the measures that are, that are meant to come into play as uh, dictated by the... Um, the Ministry of Health. But is there some skullduggery going on with capacity? Or have we lost a few ICU, UCI beds, uh, Ollie? Because I saw when you posted a Bogota Bog Post article on, on one of the social media that uh, a guy responded and he had the visuals to back this up, that Claudia Lopez was saying that we haven't been at this high number of um, capacity in terms of beds, but he said we were at this in January. So was that just a slip of the mind or people not keeping an eye on figures or, or what? Yeah, I mean, I, it wouldn't be the first time Claudia got her um, uh, numbers slightly wrong. But actually, I think what the... Yeah, I mean, that, I, I'm not sure. I, I wonder... I, I need to go back and check the quotes. I know that we definitely did have the... Um, we definitely did have the top... Uh, the top rise in a single day i know we definitely did have the top the highest number of cases on consecutive days that definitely happened um yeah i mean I, i'd have to go back and check claudia's uh, yeah. figures hey, of course the other side of the coin as well in this is that we're seeing these rises now and, and uh, record uh, cases and of course Cases are one thing, debt obviously uh, completely different, uh, another case altogether. But, um, like, are we seeing this now, the effect of what's been happening for the last maybe couple of weeks, so that the measures now, we're not really going to see any change a week down the line, knowing how, uh, the, the behavior of the virus and how it uh, operates, its modus operandi. So maybe the measures that we've had the last couple of weeks might begin to kind of click into gear in another week or so, or is that me being overly optimistic? No, yeah, that's the idea. I mean, basically, the, the sort of the Easter stuff, you know, people go away at Easter, then it's the week after Easter, and then it's kind of two weeks after that that we, we expect to be sort of into the big surge. Uh, Claudia thinks that the peak is a about 10 days away now um so that, that's why i'm assuming a sort of two-week lockdown okay and how has it been down your side like I've, obviously this is a a running theme here for me like i i feel you know the barrio kind of operates at, at its relatively normal levels uh, during these weekend total lockdowns and in inverted commas even tonight now i was out and, and shame on me it was about 10 past eight before i got back to the house but it was still busy enough obviously they come to do their rounds yet uh, in in santander seat though they were doing them in verbanal as i saw so until they did that i guess people were still availing of the la last minutes uh, before the talk of the gate uh, kicked in but like here as i said so it's been like you wouldn't know that there's meant to be a total lockdown, put it that way. What what has it been like down around your neck of the woods? I'd say it's been relatively normal. Yeah, I haven't noticed a great 
difference, I have to say. Um, certainly the park on Saturday and Sunday was pretty busy. Um, the parks obviously now are open. Well, or might be about to not be open. Who knows what's going to happen at the weekend. Um, and, and, of course, the big marijuana, I don't know what you call it, the, the 420 day uh, protest gathering. A gathering sounds nice. The big marijuana gathering on uh, Tuesday. Um that was affected by rain, but it certainly wasn't affected by police. There was no policing off that. I'd wonder, and we'll get onto this later, I suppose, I would wonder if that's kind of connected to uh, next week's strike. They don't want any negative uh, policing now. Um, but yeah, people have been gathering, acting normal, as far as I can see. It was a lovely day today, and, and Chapinero was fairly busy. I think it's important to get your vitamin D into you if you can as well. Get out in that sunshine. As long as I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you what, Brendan, I'll just have a quick look outside. Um, Go on. Yeah, it's okay. quiet outside. I wouldn't say it's um, it, it's quiet. Um, there are people walking down the street, though. Okay, well, if I was to do that, it would take me about, um, I have to go through two doors and different things to, to, to check the outside window from, from my position here, so I won't do that, but uh, it's, it's, it sounded quiet before I came on this uh, broadcast. But um, we mentioned uh, in the intro as well, Ollie. Uh, well, I don't think, have you, well, there, there's actually a couple of things around the COVID issue, I think, that you want to touch on. Um, uh, a couple of Police, or well, more than a couple, I guess, police officers jumping the queue for the for the vaccine. Police bosses. Um, I mean, let, let, let's let, let's be quite clear about this. I mean, like in any strata of society, it's certainly not the rank and file that are jumping ahead. Um, but yes, Caracol are reporting um, this evening that um, that some bosses are jumping ahead of the queue, and there's a bit of uh, outrage about that. Obviously, we've seen politicians getting on it, etc. I mean, talking to friends, it sounds like very rich people are just swanning off to America to get their vaccines. Um, so this is hardly a surprise. Yeah, and I saw, you know, the, the idea that um, vaccines would be available for, for private companies uh, to distribute um, or private health entities or however it is, whatever the exact uh, wording of it or who it's going to go through. But Pfizer has said they're not going to make any of their vaccines available for this program. I saw that in Blue Radio. So, yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to see what's going. On. I mean, things are getting very complicated um, at the moment. Full stop. Partly because I think, you know, big pharma is normally fairly shameless, but I think they've got one eye on the fact that um, Covax is under enormous pressure at the moment. The vaccine sharing scheme. So it's currently very, very hard for. Uh, poorer countries to get rid to get hold of vaccines at all. Uh, so we're going to see some problems in certain countries, mainly in Asia, places like uh, Bangladesh and India, facing a real problem in terms of getting people um, jabbed once and, and a very real uh, risk that they won't be able to get a second jab, which renders the first one pointless. So it's almost worse than useless. Yeah, of course, India are making them, producing them themselves there. So I believe they've kind of stopped exporting as well because they want to get their own population uh, inoculated. That, that, which... That's right, but they appear to be in production uh, uh, problems, uh, ramping up production. So, um, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Well, look, Ali, uh, we've been talking about COVID every week and we will be talking about it uh, for the next few weeks as well, no doubt, and <laughs> months. But another thing that we've been talking about a long time and it's an ongoing saga here is tax reform in this country. We mentioned it last week. We had just it was kind of hot off the presses at the time in terms of these proposals from the uh, Ministry of Finance here, Minasienda. Uh, there's a lot in it, a lot of interesting stuff in it, but no surprises that the majority of people are saying, uh, to borrow from some Ulster politicians, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Your, your favourites there. Yeah, look, um, it's not um, it's not popular, full stop. It's not popular with the left, it's not popular with the right, it's not popular with the rich, it's not popular with the poor. I find it absolutely bizarre, uh, Brendan. Now, I, you know, I've spent the whole week in the university saying to my students, what do you think of the Reforma Tributaria? And my students will said, oh, it's terrible, profits, terrible, terrible. And then I've said, okay, how many of you have read it? 
hands up if you've read it and they all go oh not a single one brendan you know uh, about 80 students i've had this week and not a single one not one has come up and said oh yes uh, i i've read it so hold on, again, hold on Ali. I, i'm going to tweet that students do not read <laughs> This is this is shocking news altogether. Yeah, that's that's the one takeaway. But but I mean that that seems to be uh, at the bottom of it. Look, um, for those of you who haven't read it, we've got an explainer on the Bogota Post website. I highly recommend reading it. Now, I'm not going to say that I think this is a perfect um, uh, tax proposal. It's definitely not, and I'm not going to say it's something that's good for everyone. But I would say. This is probably the most progressive single proposal that I have seen in Colombian politics since I moved here. In the past nine years, I have seen nothing anywhere near as socially democratic as this. This is exactly the sort of thing I would expect the Labour Party in England uh, to suggest. Um, and it's just bizarre to see. I mean, I get the Eurobestias going after it. I absolutely understand that 110 percent you know i i know quite a lot of people who earn six seven eight nine ten million uh, a month and think genuinely think that they are part of the squeezed pressured middle classes um uh, which is you know absolutely uh, uh, bizarre but what really can i just add a quick point ali on that Go on. because you know, because sometimes people think, oh, well, you extra heroes with your money, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I've never earned uh, anything higher than four million a month in this country. And I'm certainly not even close to that right now. And I'm just putting that out there in the sense that they always think, oh, well, the foreigners here, obviously, they're on a nice one or whatever. So uh, these people, if they are thinking, oh, well, we're only on six million, we don't deserve to fall into whatever lines. Well, come on, guys. We said last night, some people here have had it too good. Uh, for too long. Yes, I, I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, who's a financial analyst, and, and his his assessment of, his, of it is there's a lot of people in Bogota, especially around Strata 4, who want to live in Sweden but pay tax in Panama. And, and fund, fundamentally put, Duque's proposal or Karaskija's proposal is that richer people should pay more and poorer people should receive more. And to me, that seems very reasonable and equitative. Now, I can understand if somebody says, well, I don't believe in uh, subsidizing poor people by taxing rich people. That's fine. But don't tell me you're left wing. If, if that's what you're saying, if you're saying, no, 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 I don't think it's right. Uh, rich people have worked hard for their money, blah, blah, blah. They should be allowed to keep it all. OK, fine. That, that's your point of view. I don't agree with it. But at least you're being coherent. What really irritates me is when you say, oh, th this tax reform measure doesn't do anything for the poor. And I say they're getting, you know, they're, there's a basic income scheme for, you know, that's being expanded, an award-winning basic income scheme. Sure, it's not perfect. No one's saying it's perfect, but it's pretty damn good. It's a hell of a lot better than what's gone before. Um, and, and it's um, uh, and, and it's going to only get better. It's not going to get worse. Then you look at VAT rebates. Then you look at uh, schemes to help poorer kids go to university. It is absolutely chock full of these measures. Then there's the green measures, you know, taxes on single use plastic. We've got the possibility of road tolls, as you pointed out, congestion charge in the city. Everybody moans about traffic in Bogota. The government say, well, OK, we might put in tolls to stop people driving around in Bogota. And everyone goes, oh, no, no, we don't like this idea. So, I mean, look, I don't understand it. And, and, and actually, one of the, the, the thing that really nobody's addressing, when they're going, oh, no, a la reforma, blah, blah, the thing that's not being addressed here is this, Brendan. There's already a problem that Colombia is spending more than it receives. That's, that's a fact. That's not going anywhere. And that deficit is getting bigger. It's spending more and more and it's receiving less and less. And that money has to come from somewhere. There, I mean, OK, if, if this falls, if it doesn't go through, that's fine. But the next government has to do something or the government after that. Or you go into Argentina and you just say, OK, we'll, we'll flush the economy down the toilet and that's that. Yeah, well, uh, Colombia's always been throughout history really uh, if, if you delve into it kind of um, 
fiscally prudent in how it manages its mm. books, really. And that's why it's, it's tended to, to kind of be the lapdog of the United States in this side of the world as well and plays by their rules. Now, they might say, well, look at the United States right now. I mean, they're just uh, throwing out cash like uh, <laughs> like there's no tomorrow with uh, trillions of dollars of, uh, of, of injection funds or whatever you want to call them into the economy. So there could be an argument that we're in a new... Uh, fiscal policy stage and that, uh, well, you can just keep on printing money and there's no consequences for it. You know, you, you don't yeah, have yeah, to yeah, keep but, your but, on, but there is, no, 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 there's one huge difference here. The US is pretty good at claiming taxes. I mean, look, the, the elephant in the room here is that everybody likes to complain about corrupt politicians. Everybody likes to complain about enormous salaries. And let's not kid about here. Colombian senator salaries are enormous. Relative to the population, they're enormous. They're actually pretty damn big compared to uh, countries like uh, Ireland or, or the United Kingdom. However, there's the, the tax avoision uh, by which I mean evasion and avoidance, um, uh, uh, level in Colombia is for income taxes, it's over a third. For uh, EVA sales tax, it's around a quarter. That's enormous. Absolutely enormous. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, the only thing is, though, are there people here that seem to enjoy the chaotic nature of the country? It's like they don't want to maybe bring it to, to a, a Nordic model, if I can call it that, or a socially democratic country in Northern Europe, and kind of follow, well, as you said, the United States are very good at collecting taxes, but here it's kind of raw capitalism in its crudest form in many ways, and, and, and all the giving out they do about the country, they're kind of going, well, at the end of the day, it's working for me, especially for those middle classes who might be seeing things yes. getting a little bit better for them, and, and they're happy to keep it that way. And, and and then, but, you know, strangely enough, you might say, a lot of the poor as well are kind of going, oh, no, don't like the sound of this. Again, whether they've actually read any of it uh, is debatable. Um, but I don't know, Ollie, do you want to tackle um, that comment from Richard? Well, not tackle yes, it. I, but, I, I uh, do. Yeah, I, I do, actually. Um, he makes a good point. Again, like we said, it's definitely not perfect. Um, a lot of rural land is barely taxed. Yep, that's that's absolutely true. But also a lot of rural land is, is fluff. It's pointless. It's, it's nonsense. Um, However, he says here there's nothing in the reform uh, to tax uh, wealthy people. He's bang wrong there. Uh, there's a temporary wealth tax uh, on people earning 10 million or more uh, a month. So just to put it in context, we're talking about people earning over 10 times the minimum salary. That seems like a very reasonable point to put a wealth tax to me. But he's oh, also saying that's, that's in hold land. On, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold okay. on, hold on, hold uh, on. The wealth tax also applies to people who don't have income, but do have 500 billion of um, uh, uh, worth Asset. of assets. Um, so it seems to me, now, yeah, you could own vast tracts of the Janos, and I'm sure it would be officially registered as being very cheap and all sorts of things. Look, and I'm not saying people can't get around the taxes. Of course they can. You know, tax systems the world round, as we both know from our countries, are regularly taken for a ride and made to look foolish by clever ass accountants for very rich people. People. But this is definitely a big step step in very much the right direction. Okay, and again, guys, you can check out if you go to bogatapost.com. Am I correct there, Oli? Um, you'll you'll find yep. Oli's article and, and a breakdown. Oli et al. I think there, were, there was help as well in that in terms of the breakdown. That the most certainly was, was. Yes. Yeah. About. Uh, just to, to, uh, thanks to Tajal. Um, Alu uh, Walia, you can tell me how to pronounce that one. Um, just in terms of India and their vaccines, he says they have a, a ton of vaccines uh, going to waste. Um, how so, Tajal? And by the way, Tajal, Richard, uh, second half of the show, we're going to be talking about it's our first installment of Bite Size Bogota localities and barrios uh, that are popular to live in for expats, foreigners, and uh, locals as well. We're going to be talking about La Candelaria. Have either of you and, and uh, everybody else listening, what are your thoughts of La Candelaria? We're going to be getting to that in about five minutes' time. But from the strike, well, okay, just one other thing. You mentioned the Minister for Finance. Uh, he had a bit of a faux pas, whatever, this week, uh, a foot-and-mouth moment, I should say, about the, the price of a dozen eggs. 
um, 1,800. It's like when you ask these politicians, how much does a coffee cost in the standard panaderie or something? And, and they give a ridiculous answer. Uh, but he <laughs> had this at 1,800. I'd love to know where you can get a dozen eggs for 1,800 pesos in Bogota, at least. Maybe oh, yeah, that's not on the yeah. countryside. Yeah. Although there was a, a, a company, and maybe they'll sponsor us, I think it's uh, Santa Anita Huevos, um, kind of the, the elite eggs of, of Colombia. Because of that error, they did offer for 24 hours a dozen eggs for 1,800 pesos. Did I buy any? I didn't. Yeah, I, I missed out on that one. But yeah, look, this is going to drag on and on. Obviously, it has to go through uh, the Senate and all that kind of stuff, so we'll see how it gets watered down. But linked to the... well. It's, this is going to be added on to what we're expecting next Wednesday is a national strike. There are a lot of issues at play here. It's not just tax reform, tax reform. It's just the latest in many grievances that people have, Ollie. Um, are we going to have a massive strike in the middle of, um, uh, of a pandemic? Who knows? Um, it's so hard to work this one out, Brendan. It really, I'd say it's a bit of a crapshoot, honestly, trying to uh, work out what's happening here. So part of me thinks that, yeah, it's going to be really big, but I'm in the sort of bubble where everybody I know supports the paro. Um, that definitely doesn't um, apply to everybody. I'd also say that Claudio Lopez has been quite clear about this and said, you know, uh, having protests in the middle of a pandemic, it, it's not on and, um, and and you will be stopped. Now, she said that really um, with respect to the business owners that were striking against her lockdown measures. Um, you'd expect her to be a little bit more supportive of the Paro Nacional, but I don't know how that's going to play out. And the critical part of this is going to be what state is the city going to be in uh, next week? I wouldn't be surprised to see a Sunday announcement saying really strict lockdown for two weeks and then the pyro uh, organizers saying we'll put a two week delay on the protest. So let's see if that happens. If it doesn't, it could be quite interesting. Like I say, watching the marijuana gathering on Tuesday was illustrative. There was no heavy policing and no SMAD even on the side streets. You know, normally when we have big events in the uh, Parque Nacional, we have a smad on the side street ready to come in and uh, bash a few heads uh, when the time comes. That definitely wasn't present uh, on Tuesday. Now, part of me thinks they, they don't want another, they don't want a situation kicking off where they're giving people another reason to protest. But I wonder if it will be indicative of, of how the policing will be on Wednesday. Hard to say. I would say I, I, I'm amazed that those uh, potheads managed to uh, get to the protest on time or whatever it was that marijuana gathering uh, on, on on Monday or whatever day it was. Fair play to them for even getting there. Well done. Um, but if this is any indicator of what it's going to be like the 28th of April, I have to say there's a group here that I'm now part of, and outside of uh, derogatory. Mem memes and, uh, and messages about Venezuelans. They do have uh, other messages on it. It's called Joe Vivo in San Antonio y Verbenal. And there's been a lot of messages about, you know, come on, guys, we've got to go on strike for this, you know, mentioning the, the tax reforms and all other issues and the, the quarantine. So, uh, you know, it seems to be getting a lot of uh, interaction whenever those um, messages are posted. So we shall see, I guess. Uh, we'll know this time next week when we'll have our, our Thursday show next on the 29th. Uh, how it's been. Time shall tell. A um, couple of uh, comments in there, Ali. Is there, um, you can have a go with Tajal's uh, surname there if, if you want and read out his comment. Uh, Alu Alia. Actually, he does tie into our next part because the last time I saw Tajal was in fact in Donia Sessi. Um, oh. He, he used to do, uh, he did a little bit of work with us at the Bogota Post. Um, so he's saying, look here, um, yeah, six percent of vaccines are going to waste. That doesn't seem that high. I mean, I, I guess it is. Maybe. I mean, you'd expect, I think, around five percent in loss anyway, wouldn't you? In a uh, in, in any kind of medical procedure. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. going to be a bit hard. So, sounds uh, very just, Yeah, so? indeed. I, I was just going to say, before we get on to our, uh, our main topic, uh, Bite Size Bogota, a um, little bit of football news. We're going to have the Copa America all to ourselves, if it goes ahead at all. Argentina <laughs> pulled out from the, um, the, the, the co-hosting of this year's 
uh, delayed, but it was meant to be the 2020, of course, Copa America, um, postponed until and, this and summer. But hopefully, hopefully from football altogether. <laughs> Argentina. <laughs> Would you not like to see Messi play in a in a Copa America here, Ali? I quite I quite like Messi, uh, but Argentina, as a nation in football terms, uh, have just been a disgrace for most of their history. Let's be honest. Uh, anything to do there with a certain handball as well, back back in the eighties? Yeah, and, and and also bribing the Peruvians to leave their group when they're at home. Military intimidation of the Dutch team. Um, the, the 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 terrible terrible scenes in 1962 against Chile. Yeah, they've got a lot of things on their on their on their record. Okay, well anyway, bringing it back here though, will it go ahead? Like like it's still, I find it amazing. Even Duque's um, nightly address. I think it was on Monday or Tuesday night. I had the misfortune of, of being in a panaderia when it was on, and and I saw he had a little bit of you know talking about oh you know the Copa America and preparations going ahead for. Are they being ridiculously over optimistic considering <laughs> the state we seem to be in right now? Well, I mean, I, I was thinking about this. I, I think one of the key things might be it, the European clubs will be on holiday, don't forget. So even if you're on a red listed country, two weeks quarantine won't really be an issue. Uh, you know, the Copa America finishes in July. You know, you go and have a couple of weeks on a beach, get back to England, you know, you're in uh, or, or Spain or Italy or whatever. Um, it's not going to affect, you know, you'll be in, um, uh, in the off season. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah. Apart from yeah, fans, yeah, fans in the stadia and things like that, you know. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I don't think Claudia Lopez will be a big fan. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I don't. I don't think she kind of has any hobbies really, except taking selfies in her apartment and lying on her hammock. Check out last week's show, guys, uh, for, for more on that. Anyway, let's. Have you got something to say, Ali? No. No. Okay. I was going to say, let's get on. We've gone over the half hour mark. Uh, it is our what we're calling our bite-sized Bogota series. Over the next couple of weeks, maybe not consecutively, every now and again, we're going to come back into this bite-sized Bogota in terms of barrios and localities uh, to live in. And of course, for most foreigners who come here, uh, their first impression of Bogota is La Candelaria. It is hostel uh, center, uh, central, I should say, um, and uh, yeah, it's generally the place where most people, uh, certainly backpackers anyway, end up uh, their first impression of the city. So La Candelaria, the historic center, and what we, we want to get your thoughts, what you think of this place, because both Ollie and I have lived there as well. We no longer do, of course. I practically couldn't be much further away from where I am right now from La Candelaria. And uh, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship, I must say. We want your thoughts on it, and we will get Ollie's in a second, but we'll, Tajal Fairplaytum has got the ball rolling here. Uh, he's giving, giving, <laughs> he has given us his thoughts on La Candelaria. Ollie, what, what's Tajal told us? Well, it's uh, the same thing I told you earlier. Yeah, Donia Sessi, that trashy jukebox. And I think he's being, I think he's being tremendously unfair to the, to the Donia Sessi uh, jukebox there. I think that's a pretty solid jukebox. There are some trashy ones in the, in the Candelaria, but, um, you know, the ones with kind of soft porn videos and the like. Um, that one's pretty good, I think. There's, uh, there's a good selection of music on there. I mean, look, Donia Sessi's, come on. What happens in Donia Sessi stays in Donia Sessi. I think everybody knows what Donia Sessi is and, and where it's about. That place is a cavern. Absolutely. Well, of course, if you, yeah. If you don't know, it's on the fourth street or Carrera Cuatro, just off the Jimenez, Avenida Jimenez, I should say. Um, and yeah, it's an institution, really. Um, like, yeah, everybody knows about it. It's become really popular. Um, oh, no, I, like, love, yeah, I love the, the way that it's that. It, it's it's exactly like going into the TARDIS, isn't it? Like just this tiny little, you know, you think it's, oh, just a another tienda. And you just walk in and walk in and walk in through that weird little passage. And then suddenly you go, oh, it's quite big. Oh, there's another room there. Oh, there's, oh, there's another level. Oh, they've got a basement. Oh, well, what's this bit up here? Oh, well, hang on. I can keep on going up these stairs. What the hell's going on? And suddenly you, you just, you start to question the, you know, it's almost the size of Teatron. Yeah, exactly. It's like kind of, yeah, it's like going, you know, something from Alice in Wonderland or whatever. You run down a rabbit hole, you think, oh, this is yeah, a tiny little place. But uh, th she did expand it as well. So obviously, like, she's taken in a lot of money 
uh, over the last 10 years, I'd say, really since backpackers and foreigners started flocking to Colombia in ever greater numbers. Because when I first went there in 2012, uh, she didn't have that place out the back really extended, as far as I'm aware. And that kind of opened up about a year or so later around that time. Um, just uh, Richard as well has given us, uh, we'll come back to that because there's another few watering holes. That we, and this isn't all about watering holes, of course. There's a lot more to do in La Candelaria. Uh, than just drink uh, beer and perhaps smoke pot in in, in um, yeah. okay <laughs> sure, like, yeah. this is which which I don't do I I'll hasten to add but uh, oh. and, uh, historian here as well uh, he lived in La Candelaria in eighty eight uh, ninety uh, split between there and Santander um, still some characteristics of an actual neighbourhood even on Calle yeah because that's actually interesting you mentioned that. Um, that he says it about it being solitary and scary on a Sunday and festive afternoons, that hasn't changed. That's still the same. Well, it was anywhere from yeah, me when yeah, I yeah. last lived there, but whatever. But the interesting thing about the neighborhood, because that's one of the things that I disliked uh, and dislike about La Candelaria, it just, I never felt homely there. It, 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 you were always a foreigner, you were always a backpacker almost to the kind of locals. And there was a lack of a sense of community to the point that when I discovered uh, the, the rough and ready La Perseverancia, that became kind of my my home more so when I used to walk the 20 minutes to La Perseverancia most uh, evenings because I had a panaderia there and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I, I kind of, I didn't like that, that, that I, I never felt kind of really at home. But obviously it has a lot of good things um, going for it, as we said, outside of um, of Dona, Dona Ceci's. Um, and we might as well talk yeah, about I, some of those good I, things. I, I think I think that's a little unfair. I, I know what you're talking about. It definitely hasn't got like um, a, a neighborhood feel, but I think what it really does have more than many places in, in Bogota has a really solid feel of the certain type of people that are there. So, you know, especially up by the Chorro, you've got lots of artists. You've got lots of, you know, alternative creative types and, you know, hippies and that sort of thing, all flocking to one place. Now, none of them are from there. It hasn't got that kind of uh, local feel, if you like. Um, but they are all people brought in, um, you know, from elsewhere for that sort of unique um, uh, sort of thing that it's got going on. Yeah, um, well, Donald is a McDonald. Um, I like that, Donald McDonald. Um, I think he's a Canadian, actually. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Donald. Um, but it, he has talked about the, the pleasant memories of La Candelaria, the street performers, markets, graffiti tour, of course, which is very popular now. Uh, mentioning tours, I, I'm going to mention another one in a second because this came up with a student of mine today. The Gold Museum, of course, has got a whole host of museums, Portero Art, and I know Ali has an interesting museum to mention. Uh, art galleries, the little bakeries, of course, panaderias, you know, well, there's no better man than myself to, to hang out in a panaderia. But again, I, I never really found my local pan. Well, I did have one, but it was on, yeah, I did actually, I did have one in, in the Candelaria. I'm not sure if it's even there anymore. Um, but mentioning uh, tours, somebody told me about, uh, there was a ghost tour that you could do. Yes, uh, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, can you still do that, yeah? These days, God only knows. Well, um, okay, not in the pandemic, but I mean, when we're not in a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, we 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 reviewed it as late as a couple of years ago. Okay, okay. If you look on the Bogota website, the the Bogota Post website will have a review of the ghost tour, creepy tour, whatever it's called. Yeah. I and I guess, look at it, it, there's a lot of history to La Candelaria. Like, that's one of the things, one of the things about it, I mentioned in the introduction at the top of the show, like, it, it has the character and uh, and the culture and the history. So you see that. And, like, I think officially, isn't it like a strato dos, or, or it's like they get a strato dos status because or, because a lot of the buildings are... are one, I think. Buildings. Or one, is it? Yeah, exactly. So if you do, have a, you do have a house, I'm guessing it would be ridiculously expensive to buy a place in there now. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not that it's it's not that it's expensive. It's just almost impossible. I mean, how many okay. times have you ever walked around and seen a Benta sign? They just don't uh, change hands, Brendan, uh, until eventually, you know, uh, a developer gets hold of a whole block and just tears the whole block down to build um, kind of a new, more efficient building. Um, but, yeah, they're just – they're not for sale. They really aren't. I mean, when I was looking for um, houses 
nothing advertised for the Candelaria and walking around from work idly looking at things, just nothing there. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, and that's the good thing, because obviously those buildings though are protected and we're not going to see like high rise. OK, a few high rise buildings have invaded in certain areas, but that around the Chora de Cavedo and, and, and that kind of greater area within a, a few blocks there, um, you know, all those buildings are protected and it has it does have uh, that character. I, there's one thing I want to mention, and, and Richard might know this, considering you know, he's been uh, he knows Colombia for years and other Danias. Dania Blancas, a real kind of old school tienda slash pub because it even had like a bar and it used to have these very ornate seats like something you're sitting on there, uh, <laughs> Ollie, you know, so not these poker sponsored seats or metal, crappy metal um, tables and stuff like that. Really, really well decked out elegantly so. And it was a few blocks further south um, um, on on. on I guess it was Carrera 4 from the um, uh, Louis Angel Arango um, Biblioteca, the library, about two blocks further down, called Doña Blanca. Um, an old woman, and like she seemed a bit of an institution herself there. I'd say she probably had the place for 50 or 60 years or all her life or whatever. But it was, a, it was an interesting place. I, I'm talking in the past. It, it, I hope it's still there. I just haven't been in La Candelaria. Oh, God, it, it must be two and a half, if, if, if not three years, shame on me. Wow. But I haven't walked around there, yeah. I haven't, I haven't been down that neck of the woods, terrible. I feel well, like I live in another city. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, I've barely been down to Candelaria for obvious reasons in the past year or so. Um, um, oh, there's a shout out from uh, Tajal. Um, Chicha, where do you stand on Chicha, Brendan? Uh, where do I stand in it? Well, yeah, I'd usually maybe stand on the glass. No, I actually can drink it. I've no problem with it. Uh, yeah, I, I, my palate is kind of quite quite extended in that regard. I'm, I'm not kind of turning my nose up at it. Um, and actually, one time, I you've got chicha and you've got um, what's the other one? They're like to me, they're both the same. I don't really know what Guarapo. the difference is. Guarapo, yeah. And um, when I was in a, a village, Machita, Machita in Cundinamarca, there um, a year and a half ago or so after a long walk and I met a, an old um, couple, far, uh, farming couple, and they saw that I was kind of looked very thirsty and exhausted and they handed me guarapo at chicha, I'm not sure. And it, it was really refreshing. So I don't mind it, I do like chicha. And yeah, I've had, I've had plenty of chicha in La Candelaria and also of course, La Perseverancia is famed for, um, for, for chicha too. Uh, if, we, if we can lump La Perseverancia to La Candelaria, which you can't really. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't mind Chicha. I know you don't really like it, Ali, fair to say. Not a massive fan. It, it's not very beard friendly, I would say, especially when it's served up in the bowls. Um, no, I, I, look, there's a reason why Colombians switched to beer. And it's not just because of dirty marketing campaigns. It's also to do with the fact that beer's really nice and Chicha's not so much. Um, but it is interesting. And I, I do, the Museo del, uh, de la Chicha is really nice. It's a nice place um, just to hang out. Um, and if I've got people in town, I'll often take them into the Chorro to drink Chicha just because you got to do it, haven't you? Yeah, oh yeah, you have. Like it, it, it's it's part part of the culture, of course. So I, I've just kind of lost in some of our comments here um, because Richard's mentioning that he he had a T end on on the ten with uh, Carrera. Is that well, um, Tercera, I guess, or is it Tercera? A? I'm not sure, but anyway, one of those there. Um, but of course, T end has changed hands a lot of the time, so uh, they pop up very frequently in different places. And of course, La Perseverance, as we mentioned, is the kind of home of Chicha. But if we're kind of sticking to the entertainment side of things, um, there, there was a very popular, famous salsa uh, bar. What, what, what's that called again? Quinto? Quinta? Quibre Canto. Yeah, Quibre, yeah. Uh, have you been? No. Um, really? I did think oh. I did th I did think about taking my mother, um, but uh, sort of we all decided it would probably be um, it would probably be a bit too much on the young and raucous side, and not enough on the uh, old and stately side. Um, so no, we didn't go in the end. I, I mean, I, I've I've not a great deal of interest, I have to say. But to be honest, I, I never really went out in the. Um, I never really went out in the Candelaria, I don't think. I don't, I don't really associate it with nightclubs. I associate it with bars and restaurants. I don't really 
I don't see it as a kind of after two o'clock place, I have to say, um, in my well, head. Mentioning nightclubs, well, of course, I just want to say, and, and obviously that um, piqued the interest of uh, Maria Carolina Mataran, she was in there quickly with Kiwi Canto. I'm guessing a salsa dancer. Uh, Maria, you'll, you'll have to hook up. I, I'm renowned for my salsa dancing uh, skills, and if you <laughs> believe that, you believe anything. Uh, but in terms of nightclubs, what was it called? Candelario or ca whatever, uh, a nightclub, kind of a... Uh, um, Gringo Tuesdays or whatever night, four? light I should call it. Yeah, yeah it was on um, Cuarto, I think, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, I, I'm probably getting into trouble for saying this, but it was kind of known as a place that there'd be a lot of gringo hunters that would go there, maybe university students for uh, after their, their day studying hard or whatever. But of course, really the, the Candelaria, as, as Richard had mentioned on, on Sundays and festivals, but even on Saturdays, like it's what yeah. the university students seem to drive it in terms of any nightlife. Because at the mm. weekends, it was pretty dead from my memory. Uh, there wasn't much happening there. Um, and then another nightclub on on the, the the main plaza there, which isn't it erroneously called Par well, it is Parque de los Periodistas, but the yep. Gabriel, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. Uh, near there was a hotel there, and they used to have a, a club. You kind of go downstairs into it, if, if I recall oh, yes. correctly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, now that was you know that one would go on until I've and I'm not usually one to stay out late, but I remember you know getting home at five or six a.m. Oh, oh my there, God. there's a few other, but but like you say, it always felt a little bit too young for me. Um, and of course, for me, it, uh, the other thing about drinking in the the centre is, and I find it fascinating these places exist. It's very much like. Um, uh, Asian kids, when I was at, uh, sort of at the end of school, start of university, that they would all go out because their parents didn't like them drinking. They'd go out to discos and nightclubs and whatnot at kind of two in the afternoon and be finished up by eight o'clock to go back for for the Sunday evening, you know, meal with the, the, the parents. And that's it's very much got to drive there. So there's all these bars that get heaving at about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And you know, every time I poke my head around the door, there's 20 of my students in there, and I think, I don't want to be part of this. Yeah, well, that, that's true, especially down the Jimenez, uh, all those bars, yeah, that, like, it, Friday Friday afternoon, heaving, exactly, and people outside smoking and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but then by 10 o'clock, they're all on their way home. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, very um, much so, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Richard's on about the, the, the nightlife as well in, in the late 80s when, when Galan was, uh, Galan, I should say, God, um, was uh, assassinated then. A lot of them were literally overnight closed uh, closed down. A lot of them linked to narcos, uh, coups à change, uh, as they say in French, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> not that I'm saying they're all linked to narcos these days, of course. Are there uh, any, do, though? So, sorry, with... sorry do, you, do you mean the French or nightclub owners? <laughs> So, uh, how many more nationalities do you want to have a go at here, Ollie? You've already had a go at the, the Argentinians. This is <laughs> the Englishman on a rant against his <laughs> um, traditional enemies. But are there, if anybody knows, are there any kind of popular nightclubs there now? Because as I said, I haven't socialised in the Candelaria. I haven't socialised there for probably six years, uh, five years. Well, that's a lot. I've been out there, but not like as in kind of yeah like having a, a proper night out put it that way so i don't know if there's any popular nightclubs there right now but um of course ali it, it has its dodgy areas as well if we're kind of extending the greater las aguas candelaria area i'm sure you've wandered around the the santa fe you just need to go down a little further south I, of, I, um, well, well, hang on hang on hang on what are you trying to say here no no no, no. <laughs> i'm just saying that you by accident i used to walk to palakimau market regularly and and i go all the way down the 19 and of course yeah, okay yeah that's that's not ideal yeah yeah well um, in the day i wasn't going there at night but still obviously in the day as well it would be quite um well not for innocent eyes i'll put it that way oh no yeah that's that's quite spicy down there isn't it um yeah i find i've been through santa fe on my bicycle and it is quite regularly because you know you've got the bike shops on Trece and to get back up to Teusuquillo it's just easier to go straight up the Carrera rather than coming all the way back to to Caracas um, 
And yeah, it's the sort of barrio that I go through fast with no stopping and let's hope we don't get a puncture. Uh, travel travel through every red light with the taxis. Make sure you've got uh, cars on the side of you. Yeah, it's a bit bit spicy. Um, but actually, I, that, I agree with you because you mentioned that earlier. It, the thing that's always put me off the Candelaria in terms of living there is that like, you can't walk around easily in the Candelaria, you know. You think about that area between, let's say, 19 and about 26. Um, that's pretty sketchy after, let's say, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. That's not the nicest area to be, let's say. It's not somewhere I'd want to be regularly walking about. Um, and when you say getting lost, yeah, one of my first weeks in Bogota, I remember getting off at the Tercer Millennium and walking back up to the Candelaria on a Sunday evening and thinking, I shouldn't be here. And there's no and, way to... Yeah, and that was before the Bronx was cleaned out, the infamous Bronx. Uh, oh, which, yes. Uh, so it was even worse. I mean, the last time I was around that area, like I, I did see the improvements. I don't know what it's like at night. I take it it's still... Because you're near Las Cruces and Barrio Egipto, which Barrio Egipto I do know. Um, I used to socialize there regularly enough because, as is my want, I found a, a little tienda um, ran by... Um, a family from Armenia or, or Manizales, can't remember, but either one of those. Uh, I guess they still have their, they kind of had almost a street to themselves, all owned by the family, um, not too far away from the church in Barrio Egipto. Um, but yeah, those barrios wouldn't be wouldn't be seen as the, as the friend, well, not, not, I would say we're not the friendliest, but uh, you'd want to know who you're dealing with when you're, when you're around there. And yeah, Las Cruces, Egipto, and then down, as you said, down to Tercer Millennium, not areas you want to be, uh, getting lost in anyway, for sure. No, that that's that's definitely true. I mean, Las Cruces is fine in the daytime. Yeah, um, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not somewhere you'd want to be. You know, hanging around too late. I think, but it's all right in the daytime. They've got some nice junkyard shops down there. Okay. Well, speaking of shopping, of course, as well, we've got San Victorino, um, and then. Um, all the plazas, Plaza España. I know that's kind of going further uh, east, but but it's still linked really to La Candelaria. And, and any foreigner really who lives in La Candelaria or visits La Candelaria are surely going to go down to San Victorino to see all the, the crappy uh, products that you can buy um, dirt cheap or get ripped off, of course. I used to regularly go there to buy lots of football jerseys whenever I'd be going home to Ireland for nieces and nephews. Just you know, buy your... your um, your chibiadas, as they call them, Cam camisetas chibiadas yeah. for, um, you know, 15,000 or whatever, even 10,000 for, for a top. But yeah, like that, that's pretty well known. And um, I'm sure, has Ollie shopped there? Is that is that uh, below you? I've shopped in San Victorino. It's, um, <laughs> okay. it's, I mean, to, to, to be honest, it, it, there's not a great deal there that's, there's not a great deal to bring me there, you know, that I can't get at similar shops recently. There's no specialist shops there necessarily that, that interest me. Generally, I'm going through San, San Victorino you know, to go out the other side to go onto the bike shops uh, down the Tracy. Um, okay. It's not the best area in Bogota to go there, but it's, it's pretty good. I'd also say that there's some... Um, a lot of foreigners don't seem to know this, but for white goods, you know, things like... Um, uh, fridges and, and that sort of thing, um, washing machines, yada, yada, yada. Um, just uh, off to the side from San Victorino is very good. Yeah, domestic appliances, actually, yeah, fair point. And for those who are interested in, um, now I know people would like to buy these things, you know, properly made, maybe off indigenous or whatever, but you know, all the little bracelets and colorful things. All those shops in San Victorino, you buy them by the dozen or whatever, because you know if you were if you were last minute and buying them in the airport, you'd probably like spend ten dollars oh, on yeah. one bracelet. There, there for like two thousand pesos, you can buy twelve of them. They sell every. You have to buy them por mayor, as they say. You can't buy them individually. But I remember I have a brother-in-law who loves all these little colorful bracelets, and I bought like twelve of them back for next to nothing. Uh, Richard, we're going back uh, memory lane. Richard here, I think he's telling us Pasaje Rivas, which I have to say I don't know. Uh, but he bought a mattress there and carried it up to, <laughs> carried it up to Le Can Candelaria, fair play. Uh, 
obviously no, nobody managed to nick it off you. Um, well, we, we've covered, I'm trying to think now in terms of what, what else in the kind well, this is this, trip, you, 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 really from you mentioned them before, but um, the museums, of course, are all sort of based around that. And also, let's uh, something we've touched on but never really explained. It is very much, I think if you're talking to Colombians, I think they very much say, that the Candelaria is defined as being a student area. It's a university uh, block. It's not a. Um, uh, it's not really a sort of foreigner block to, to many of them. Um, yeah. And actually, a really good shout from uh, Maria Carolina again here. Um, the Banco de la República. I fully agree with her. It's so much better than the Botero Museum, especially for foreigners. I've never really understood the Botero Museum for foreign people to visit. Like, I can understand if you're a Colombian, you go, okay, well, there's a, a Picasso that I can go and look at, there's a Galgen, etc. That makes a lot of sense. I could understand that. But, you know, if you're coming from France or um, you know, New York or, uh, or, or, or or Britain, you just think, well, okay, you, you can see all of those things. And yeah, there's some Boteros, but good God, Botero is repetitive after a while. But the Museo Banco de la Republica, just next door to the Botero Museum, just up the road, absolutely fantastic. Um, really, yeah. really good. Loads of smaller artists, younger artists, um, and they also have um, tucked away at the back the famous lechuga, which is this this fantastic um, uh, sort of rosary thing, uh, built with um, emeralds. Absolutely wonderful. Lechuga. So does it look like a lettuce then? Yeah, because it's got so yeah. many, it's this kind okay. of great big fa sort of peacock fan shape with all these, so many emeralds in it that, that it looks um, like a lettuce. Yeah, I have to say, Snap, Richard, he, uh, he mentions, of course, the Botero Museum does have Botero in it for people who want to come yeah, and see yeah. what I was thinking about. You see that in many museums. I, I guess, it, so. it does, yeah, and I'd say they're generally better. There are actually a couple of good Boteros hidden away on the top floor. Uh, the smaller prints that he does but you know mostly it's just yeah yeah okay lots of fat people they're very sensual but you were saying was it yesterday when we were having our chat that it was the police museum that you liked or was it another one which one you kind of said was your your favorite um uh, uh, the, the traditional dress museum uh Trajes ah, okay. Tradicionales de Colombia it's also got a little hidden note you get a bonus not only is it all this spectacular clothing but also they've got the um they, they've, they've got this wonderful, and I very much agree with Richard there, um, they've, they've got this wonderful, wonderful um, uh, room dedicated to uh, Bolivar's lover, um, which is really wonderful. Okay. So a quick thing I want to mention, and I, I've, we've referred to this, the um, Biblioteca um, Luis Angel Arango, the, the mm. library. I used to use that like a, as you know, a place to go and study and work. Obviously, they're free. But then there was another one, and again, I can't remember the name. I'm not even sure if it even had a name on it. I, I guess there was a plaque. But a real quaint little library. And it was kind of hidden away. Somebody told me about it. Uh, when I discovered it, I, I kind of used to go there instead of uh, Luis Angel Arango, which is more popular, obviously. Um, but it's like maybe two blocks further north from Luis Angel Arango, but on the four and then up. So between the three and the four, I think. Uh, I just can't remember the name, but it was a lovely quaint little library. I, mean, I guess it's still there, um, just like one floor. And, and, and what I liked, of course, uh, Mr. Loving to get freebies, is that the, the empleados used to come around and give you coffee. So it was great. You wouldn't get this in Luis Angel Arango. So <laughs> was, it was a great touch. Uh, it's the small little things, you know, they, they, they matter. Um, I will. I, I want to couple, address a couple of these. Richard Stoller mentions the Boteros. I fully agree. A single Botero statue, a single Botero painting is much more effective than lots of them all at once. Donald McDonald uh, bringing up the craft beer scene. Uh, no, in La Candelaria, it's uh, it's not growing at all. It's almost completely dead. Uh, but a craft but, but, beer but, but, tour, uh, hang on, craft beer tour, very much uh, to be promoted. If you go to our website, uh, Donald McDonald, the bugtapost.com, you will see loads of reviews of the craft beer scene in Bogota. It's just a lot further north these days. Holly, the last time we met face to face, if I believe it was February 2020, were we not in a craft beer place on the on the um, market de los periodistas? The, the last time we met face to face was in my oh, no. house. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean having a beer, sorry, um, uh, and, and not in a neutral venue. It was in La Candelaria and in... Um, yes, it was. Uh, but yeah, that's, but that's that was closed. Beer. Yeah, and, they, and they've closed. Oh, oh it's closed. Oh, okay. Yeah. And quickly mentioning, because you love this one, the, the, the Doors place with the door being the Union oh, yes. Jack flag. Cesar, still legend. Legend. Still there, okay. still open. We've got time, guys. Yeah, we've got to go. Our producer's on to us. Have a good week, guys. We'll be back next week. Ciao.